Chris Hickman, in 2008, was a firefighter down in Florida. He was called to the scene of an accident. There he found an old model Chevy Blazer laying on its side. The driver's arm was trapped between the vehicle and, uh, and the road. And they didn't have the equipment to lift the vehicle. They didn't have a way to remove the man from this excruciating situation. And so Chris Hickman did what he didn't believe he could do. He lifted up that SUV 12 inches off the ground and held it there while the other firefighters removed that man's arm from under the car and got him to safety. He lifted an SUV. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? There's a man by the name of Maurice Paderaski. That's as close as I'm going to come to that name. They nicknamed him Python. I could pronounce that. Python won five world's strongest man competitions before he retired to become a mixed martial art fighter. This man was able to bench press 640 pounds. He was able to squat lift 859 pounds, and he was able to deadlift 947 pounds. I want to tell you, maybe, maybe some of you haven't worked with weights before. That is amazing. Angus McGaskill lived a while back. He didn't have an abnormal growth condition. Somehow, naturally, he grew to the size of seven foot nine inches tall. He weighed over 500 pounds, and he did a lot of amazing things by his strength during his life. I, I think maybe the most impressive one was that he was able to lift and carry with him a 2,500 pound anchor. <laughs> Amazing. In human history, from time to time, we see people with exceptional power. We see people able to do unbelievable things. From our human condition, we understand these things are not normal. These things are not natural. And yet they had this unnatural ability to have such power on display in their lives. And you know something about that? There is no human in all of existence that is able to display even a fraction of the power that is our God's power. The might that our God displays is far above anything that any man can do. This morning I'd like to share with you from God's word, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, in which we find these words. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. God has amazing power. Our text said, by his divine power. By his divine power, God called darkness out of the light, the light out of the darkness and dispelled the darkness. By his divine power, he set the planets and the stars in their place in a vast universe. By his divine power, he ordered the orbit of those planets. By his divine power, he separated the land from the waters on this earth to be able to have a place to establish the life that he had in mind to establish. By his power, he called the inanimate into life. By his great power, God did all the miraculous work in those seven days of creation. And then having completed those days, by his divine power, he ruled over all the things that he had created. 
when man rebelled against God and there was only one family left in all the world that would do his bidding. God sent a flood, sent torrential rains down, lifted up the fountains of the deep, and covered the entire earth with water. By God's power, when mankind was again established, and places in the plains broke out like Sodom and Gomorrah to do despicable things. God sent down sulfur and fire from the heavens and utterly destroyed them, wiped them off the face of this earth. By God's great power, he led his people out of Egypt, a slave nation he brought into this wilderness. By his power, he fed them with the manna from the heavens. He, he satisfied their thirst with water which flowed out of a rock. By his power, he separated the Red Sea and allowed them to pass into that wilderness on dry land. Imagine that. He caused there to be a void in the water. He caused the water to be separated so that dry land was exposed and an entire nation passed between the waters as he held them for perhaps hours that it took for that great nation to pass through them. And then when they left the the wilderness to go into the promised land. Once again, he did that same thing with the Jordan River. He parted it and they crossed over on dry land again. He ordered the waters to disobey the natural order and to stand on their side. God performed many mighty powerful things that are recorded through us for us all through the, the Old Testament. God stopped mighty armies in their tracks. God ruled over nations and caused some to disappear and some to rise up. God reordered history by his power. But this passage that talks about his divine power isn't speaking about God the Father. If you read the previous verse to the one that we took for our text this morning, you'll find out it's Jesus, Jesus Christ, God's Son, God in the flesh. That's the one that's being spoken of when it talks about by his divine power. And we see that in the life of Jesus. As Nathan and Eric uh, illustrated for us in the uh, pre-show here, you know, changing water into wine, and uh, we'll probably be able to use that wine later for our communion time. So it's, no, he didn't change the color of water. He didn't change the flavor of water. He changed the very essence of of the water to become something that it was not before. He changed it into wine instantaneously and not just ordinary wine, but the head of the feast, the expert in the wine, pronounced it to be the finest wine that they had served that day. That's God's power on display in the life of Jesus Christ. We see in Jesus' life him healing the blind, him healing the lame, him healing the deaf, him restoring speech to the dumb, him being able to allow people to be cured of diseases that were incurable at the time. Even leprosy, he allowed them to, to be able to be free of that dread disease which separated them from their family and friends and society in general by his power, by his power, he even restored some who were dead to life. He cast out demons. He walked upon the surface of the water in the Sea of Galilee, out where the water was very deep. 
He came walking across the water, not sinking into it. And then when he arrived at the small fishing boat in which his troubled disciples were afraid because of the mighty power of the wind and the waves in this storm, he said the words, peace, be still, and the storm obeyed him. Instantly the waters were calm, the wind stopped, the rain ceased, and they were able to go on. At the end of his earthly ministry, he was crucified. He was put in the grave dead, confirmed dead. And three days later, he conquered death, emerging from there. That's power. That's amazing power on display in Jesus' life. And I want to tell you this morning, we don't just have the biblical record to prove that. I mean, a lot of us are glad to take what the Bible has to say about this as fact. But maybe some of you are more skeptical than that. Maybe some of you are inclined to think that these were just made-up stories that were passed around about Jesus. Well, let me give you one proof that we have that that was not the case. That is in the life of his closest followers. These men who had been with him day and night for years who saw everything that was going on in his life, that saw miracles up close and personally, not just one, not just two, not just three, but dozens of miracles performed. They saw it up close, and they knew for certain that his power revealed who he was. They were so certain that after Jesus had returned to heaven to sit by his father's side, they continued to live their lives according to that belief. It didn't matter if they were suffering poverty for the sake of Christ. It didn't matter if other people were persecuting them because of what they were teaching. It didn't matter if they had to face imprisonment or punishment or exile. It didn't even matter for them when given a choice to renounce Christ or die. They chose death because they believed with all of their lives. They bet their lives on the fact that this had taken place. I think that's a powerful evidence about what Jesus Christ performed. That's amazing that men would be willing to die because they were so convinced that Jesus was who he claimed to be, that his power on display was what they had seen. Our text tells us this morning not just about his divine power, but it also tells us that he uses that power for us. We see it in our text this morning. His divine power has given us everything we need. I want you to think for a moment about those comic book characters. You know, the ones that have become uh, multi-million dollar making movies that have become so popular over the last couple of decades. They have superheroes with mighty powers, and they have supervillains with mighty powers. And what makes the difference between those two? The villains are using their power for themselves, for their own means, and the heroes are using their powers to benefit others. This is the amazing thing about our Lord. He has this great power, but he's not using it to advance himself. He's using it for our sake. Our passage tells us he is using it to, uh, it to bless our lives. Our Lord gives us everything that we have need of. Everything for a godly life. By his power, he takes away the sins that had separated us from God and made us 
incapable of living the godly life. He made us able to live this life before the Lord because of his great power on display on that cross. By his power, he gave us the strength and the guidance that we need to live that life, which goes against the prevailing tide of this present world. All the world is going in one direction, and the Lord would have us to go in the opposite direction. And by his power, we are able to take that stand. Think about what it means to have his power in your lives. There are things that we face in this world that would overwhelm us. I don't know what you've experienced in your own life. I don't know what's ahead of you in your life in this world. But I can be pretty sure of this. There are going to be circumstances which test you to the core. There are going to be griefs that come upon you which weigh you down. There are going to be people that turn against you and betray you that are going to hurt you so bad, cut you so deeply. How are we going to make it through a world of sorrow and loss like this? Because we have God's great power to see us through the worst of times. I can tell you from my own experience as a hospital chaplain for years, I saw those people who were suffering things and didn't have a faith in God, and I saw those people who were suffering the same things and sometimes worse, who had a faith in God, and the strength God gave them to deal with those things was amazing in the joy that they still had in their life, in their determination, because they knew that God was at their side. They knew that God would not allow them to fail. There are times in this world when people will oppress us, And sometimes they will prevail against us. But no one will prevail long against God's people because by his power, he's going to give us the victory. Whether in this life or in the judgment which follows, he's going to vindicate his people by his great power. And that great power of God is ours, our passage tells us through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. In other words, to know him is to trust him. When we know God, when we have knowledge of God, we are in line to receive of his power because our faith becomes the means, the channel by which God delivers that power to us. It is the power cord through which the power soars soars into our lives. Knowing him is what we must seek by spending time in prayer and his word. But always, always we must remember that we have the ability to know him and we have the ability to receive his power in our lives, not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done for us. And this passage puts us back, that back in this perspective about his calling of us. You see, so often we think it's about our response. We credit ourselves with our salvation for the way that we have responded to what God's done for us. You know something? The response is not the power of our conviction. The response is only receiving what God has ready to give to us. By our response, we only open ourselves up to what God intends that we should have in our life. It's by his power. It's by his strength. It's by his will that we have power in our lives. Our reaction doesn't purchase anything. It's only the agreement to allow God to use us. In conclusion this morning, our God is great. His power is limited, uh, unlimited, and through Jesus, that power can be made active in your life. Power to live the, God, the life that God intended that you should live. Power to overcome the worst things that life can throw at you. Power for every moment of every day of your life. 
And that's what our invitation time's about this morning. If you'd like to have God's power flowing into your life, if you'd like to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and to follow him from this moment on, if you have any decision that you'd like to make, you can come forward during this invitation time and you can make that decision. And we're going to have people come up front here and they're going to be ready and available if you'd like to talk with somebody or pray with somebody about a decision that's on your heart. They'll be up here and ready to hear what you have. We're going to take just three minutes of quiet reflection and allow this invitation time for you to respond. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us through your great power. We're thankful, Lord, that your might is not applied just to your own ends, but that you desire, Lord, that we should be recipients of all that you can bless us with. And so just now, Lord, we ask that you might work on our hearts through your Holy Spirit and help us to make the decisions we need to make right now. Watch over us during this invitation time, we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen.